It's official. Inside is gone. Perseverance is putting samples onto the surface of Mars, more science results from James Webb, and using gravitational wave observatories to detect warp drives. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Well, it's happened. We've learned that the last messages ever sent from InSight have been received, and NASA has decided to officially pull the plug on this amazing mission. So the last time they were able to successfully communicate with the Mars InSight lander was December 15th. And then they attempted to check in on December 18th, and no response. And NASA knew this was going to be happening. The energy levels were steadily dropping as dust was continuing to clog up the solar panels on InSight. And it was getting to the point where it could no longer keep itself warm through the night, be able to power up its instruments and to be able to send signals home. But still, it was an incredible mission. And although it was originally only supposed to last for one year, it lasted for four years. And although the mole, which was to dig down and measure temperature differences in Mars, that wasn't able to ever be deployed, the seismometer did an amazing job. It was able to detect more than 1300 seismic events on Mars, including 50 of which it was able to figure out exactly where they were and use this to map out the interior of Mars with just more detail than we could have ever hoped for. It even detected the impact of a meteorite on Mars nearby. So this is the last picture we will ever see from InSight. It was a very good lander. Perseverance is putting samples on Mars. All right, look at this picture. When I first saw this picture, I was like, that's a lightsaber. What what is what is this? And then I had to read the caption and get a sense of what this really is. What this is is a titanium sample collector, which was filled with a rock sample by the Perseverance rover and then placed gingerly onto the surface of Mars. And of course, one of the primary missions of Perseverance is to collect a whole bunch of samples from Mars at different places that are geologically interesting, and then prepare them for an upcoming Mars sample return mission. It's carrying dozens of these samples on board the rover, but it's also laying these samples down onto the surface as a backup. And so if for some reason, it's not able to deliver the main set of samples, then a helicopter equipped with the Mars sample return mission can chase down these additional samples and bring them back and be able to send them back home. The Mars sample return mission is due to launch in 2026. And then it will arrive on Earth a couple of years after that. And just like think about that, that we will have all of these perfectly chosen samples from what is probably the best chance that there is life or was life on Mars. And these samples will be back in the hands of scientists with the biggest laboratory equipment they can get their hands on. And they will be able to study these with modern scientific techniques. And we're just a couple of years away from that. So this is a very important step. And over time, we will see more and more of these samples deposited on Mars as well as more and more of them collected by Perseverance. And hopefully, we will see the Mars sample return mission fly in 2026. An update on the Soyuz leak. Last week, I shared the breaking news that there was a coolant leak on the Soyuz spacecraft that was attached to the International Space Station. It's been a week. What do we know? Well, not much. At this point, Roscosmos thinks that the leak was caused by a piece of space debris that crashed into the outside of the spacecraft and has been bleeding all of its coolant out into space. So the big question is, is this thing safe? And the answer is, we don't know yet. Roscosmos is still investigating whether or not it's safe to put astronauts on board. The issue is if they detach from the station and try to re-enter the atmosphere, can the Soyuz keep it cool enough to make sure that its flight computers will work properly as they're going through their re-entry process? You can imagine, right? If your computers fail while you are re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, that is a very bad day for the astronauts on board. So Roscosmos has two choices at this point, either risk it, bring the astronauts home on the damaged Soyuz or wait and send another robotic Soyuz spacecraft up to the station, dock with the station, and then the cosmonauts will be able to climb on board that spacecraft and return home. So 
Right now, we still don't know what the final outcome is going to be, but but like Soyuz spacecraft are very tough. They've gone for decades, used by many missions to space and back. It's a very known technology. And at this point, I'm sure the people who are working on this can be pretty confident about what the results are going to be. So I'll keep you posted. We got the science results from DART. We've been reporting pretty consistently about the DART mission, which is, of course, NASA's mission to slam a spacecraft into an asteroid to find out how easy is it to protect Earth from a future asteroid strike. And we got an announcement of fairly official science results from the scientists who were working with DART at a recent conference. And there's a lot of detailed information here, but I'll give you a few really interesting takeaways. According to NASA, the impact released about a million kilograms of debris from the asteroid. And just for context, that is like the same mass as a giant container vessel, those big cargo ships that you see on the ocean or trapped in the Suez Canal. But what was really fascinating was the amount of that they were able to change the asteroids orbit by. And I mentioned this several months ago, that it was quite surprising that if DART had just crashed directly into Dimorphos and then just like splatted on the surface, there was a certain amount of momentum that would have been imparted by the spacecraft. But the amount was a 3.6 times more than that just straight splat onto the surface of the asteroid. And that's because when it crashed into the asteroid, it blew out this gigantic plume of debris that acted like a rocket. And so they were able to get this multiplier from the impact of the spacecraft itself. And that's really interesting, because now you can sort of imagine as you're trying to protect the Earth from future asteroid strikes, once you know, is it a rubble pile? Is it made of metal? Is it a solid rock? Then you can try to create an impactor that will not only slam a bunch of just mass into the asteroid, but you will also try to create the biggest plume that you can in order to get that additional benefit, additional change in the velocity of the asteroid. So it's a very exciting result. It's very cool to see to go from theory to an actual spacecraft that smashes into an asteroid millions of kilometers away. I mean, I think that in the past, people were more worried about the dangers of the rubble pile asteroids, that that you would just explode the thing and then it would fall apart and then come back together again and you wouldn't really do any damage. But now it really seems like actually the rubble pile asteroids are easier to work with. They're easier to change their trajectory than anyone had ever thought. So I, I think this is like a really good piece of news since these seem to be the more common small asteroids. An exoplanet is falling into its star. One of the most successful planet hunting observatories that humanity has ever launched was the Kepler mission. And this was a spacecraft really, it was designed to find another Earth, another Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star, but the reaction wheels failed on the spacecraft. And so it was unable to point itself very carefully at the various targets. That was terrible. And yet the engineers working with Kepler were able to come up with this incredible solution where they use the light pressure of the sun to keep the spacecraft directed. So it was able to continuously observe a much smaller area. It was able to observe a lot of red dwarf stars and detect planets around them. But the first planet that Kepler ever detected was Kepler 1658 B, which is a planet located around 2600 light years away. Because it's been several years since that planet was first discovered by Kepler, astronomers have been tracking the orbit of this planet around and around the star. And what they found is that the orbital period of the planet is decreasing. In other words, it's taking a shorter and shorter period to go around the star. And it's not a lot like if you add up the entire change, it's about 131 milliseconds per year which means it's going to take about 2.5 billion years to finally spiral into the star and disappear. And this spiraling is caused by the tidal interactions between the star and the planet. And by discovering this kind of a scenario, 
astronomers can now be looking for other versions of this other hot Jupiters, other objects out there that are very close to the star, they're experiencing these tidal interactions, and they're being pulled into this death spiral. And then of course, they can also measure stars and detect the presence of various heavier elements in their atmosphere. And over time, astronomers will be able to get this sense of which stars ate their planets at what point in the process, how many planets are gone because they fell into their stars? What does the future hold for the solar system? And more interesting questions like that. So it's a fascinating result. You only got two and a half billion years to book your vacation to Kepler 1658b before it's gone forever. If you like the work that we do, consider joining our Patreon. Now if you notice, I don't put any ads in the middle of the video. I don't do any big long sponsorship agreements here in the videos, try to keep them as concise and content rich as possible. And the only reason that we can do that is because of the amazing people who support us on Patreon. And of course, if you want to join our Patreon, I'll remove all the ads from Universe Today for life, as well as you get special behind the scenes information, access to our videos in advance. So join our community, go to patreon.com slash universe today, but at least if you just give a thanks to the patrons in the comments down below, that would be awesome to show that you really appreciate them giving you the ad freest possible version of our content here on YouTube. Thanks. James Webb sees star formation in the Carina Nebula. I'm really enjoying this unfolding story. If you remember back in July, we got those first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. We got the Southern Ring Nebula. We got an exoplanet. We got a version of the deep field. And one of the other images that we got was of the Carina Nebula. But each of these were just like a brief snapshot, a picture with not a lot of scientific information to go along with it. And then each one of these pictures has now had a proper science journal article written about it. And so this week, we got the one for the Carina Nebula. And I'm sure you can probably predict what you're going to see when you take a really powerful infrared observatory and you point it at one of the most interesting star forming regions that we know of, you see stars forming. And so in this paper, the astronomers said that they saw about two dozen outflows that were coming from brand new stars that had never been seen before. I mean, you think about the stars, right? The stars go through this process. They start out as just this cloud of hydrogen. Then as they start to collapse, they start to bring in these inflows, these feeding clouds of hydrogen and helium that are falling into the star, allowing the star to build up more mass, being able to spin up, flatten out as an accretion disk. And as the star becomes more and more mature, as it heats up and as it's bringing in enough material, it starts to create these jets, these polar jets of outflowing material that then move out into the space around them and start to carve out these vast cavities, these bubbles. And then the stellar wind from all the different stars as they fully ignite are blasting out this radiation that starts to clear out this material and you get these pillar formations and these cliffs at the edge of the nebula. It's an amazing picture and it's really wonderful to see the underlying science. I, I can't even imagine like if I was one of the astronomers trying to work with this, you just just keep going. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. It's an amazing picture and it's great to see the science. NASA tests the next version of its RS 25 engines. The Space Launch System core stage has four RS-25 rocket engines on board. These are powered by liquid hydrogen and oxygen and deliver the thrust from the core stage of the SLS. These engines were originally designed and developed for the space shuttle, and they were designed to be fully reusable. Every time the space shuttle orbiter would return to Earth, they would pull the engines out, they would refurbish them, repair them, get them ready for another mission. And many of these engines flew on several space shuttle missions. But on the new SLS, these engines are destroyed. They get one last flight and then they fall into the ocean with the core stage and they're destroyed. What this means is, is that NASA is going to run out of RS-25 engines before they've done very many launches of the space launch system. NASA is aware of this and they have queued up the purchase for several more RS-25 engines from Aerojet Rocketdyne. This is the company that built them in the first place. Actually, just a quick side note, Aerojet Rocketdyne is probably gonna be acquired by L3 Harris for $4.7 billion. So I guess 
they've got a customer who's going to keep buying these engines. So it makes sense to acquire the company. So NASA just test the newest iteration of the RS 25 on their test stand, the RS 25. E. And this is essentially the same as the original RS 25 D engines and before that flew with the space shuttle, but there are a bunch of minor improvements, modern technology that's been installed on these engines. They did their hot fire test for three and a half minutes and it worked exactly how they wanted to. You can see this gigantic plume of water vapor coming out of the rocket. It's just steam. And that's because this engine is powered by liquid oxygen and hydrogen, which turns into water vapor as it comes out of the rocket exhaust. This next generation of engines will be flying on Artemis five and beyond. And you can see all of the pieces are coming together for the future missions of the space launch system. NASA has purchased Orion capsules up to Artemis eight. They've purchased core stages up to Artemis six. And now they are queuing up all of the rocket engines that will be supplied well into those same numbers as well. It still breaks my heart to know that RS 25 engines are going to be destroyed with each launch. They're such beautiful, amazing, very powerful engines. And it just sucks to see that they're going to be burning up and falling into the ocean. Could we detect warp drives? The more you learn about space, the sadder you become when you realize that space is gigantic. Like it's right there in the name. And we think about like, how are we going to get from star system to star system? And the best ideas that people are coming with today is like, maybe if we really worked hard, we could figure out a propulsion system that could carry us 10% the speed of light. So it would take you 40 years to get to Alpha Centauri It would take you millions of years to cross the Milky Way. That that's too slow. Where is the Star Trek Star Wars future that science fiction has promised us? We want warp drives. Well, we don't know any way to do warp drives. And they may very well violate the laws of physics as we understand them. But maybe there's some advanced civilization out there that has mastered the technology of warp drives, and they are zipping across the cosmos with their warp drives. But there's a new paper that says that we might actually be able to detect the gravitational waves that are released as warp drives are activated across the universe. But the amount of gravitational waves that would be released compared to the sort of mass that's required are pretty astounding. And so according to their calculations, we could detect a spacecraft with the mass of Jupiter moving within the Milky Way, which would be a very big spaceship. Or we could detect a spaceship with, say, the mass of the moon within the few closest stars to Earth. So with our current crop of gravitational wave observatories, we would only be able to detect like the most powerful spacecraft. But future gravitational wave observatories will be coming online over the coming decades. And it could be that we will get to smaller and smaller masses that we could potentially detect. And I'm like, wouldn't it be amazing if astronomers were able to start tracking the movements of warp drive capable spaceships around our region of space and through that be able to start reverse engineering maybe how these things are actually built. Of course, it's science fiction on top of science fiction. But I always love the idea of scientists coming up with really clever ways to search for things that could be at the very limit of our understanding. All right, those are all the news stories that we had today. Now you can dive deeper into any of the stories that I shared with you. All of the links are in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news for today. We will see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.